Hello everyone. Welcome to Teaching with Magic, a podcast exploring the intersection of education, fantasy, and literacy. Here at Teaching with Magic, we explore the different ways that teachers in the fiction and in the real world make magic for their students. You'll hear discussions about teachers and teaching methods in fantasy, science fiction, and pop culture. You'll hear interviews with scholars in various fields about important topics in education, and you'll get to be a part of an ongoing conversation about why the imagination matters. Welcome to Teaching with Magic. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to another episode of Teaching with Magic. I'm your host, Elise trudel Cedeno. And today, we're turning back the clock to the 7th century, give or take a few hundred years, because we're going to discuss a very famous poem that's been on many an English literature syllabus. That's right, folks, we're talking about Beowulf. Beowulf has been a celebrated English epic for many a century, but it's a text that has only been a part of the English curriculum in universities since the 19th century. Around that time, Scholarship focused primarily on Beowulf and other Anglo-Saxon texts as pieces of historical evidence, on their existence as manuscripts, and what those manuscripts were able to tell historians about Scandinavian culture, England, and Englishness, and what that meant before the Norman Conquest. However, J.R.R. Tolkien's famous lecture, Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics, disputed that reading and reminded critics that Beowulf was an epic, a poem, and that it needed to be studied as a story and a work of art. Since then, Beowulf has been the subject of countless translations, adaptations, and retellings, and is studied worldwide, at the high school level and in universities. Like many, my first encounter with Beowulf was in my honors English class in my sophomore year of high school. I don't remember exactly how my teacher taught it or what it was about the story that drew me in, but I do remember it with joy. When I was a student at Signum University not so long ago, I had the opportunity to study Beowulf in a different way. Before taking Beowulf as a course, I had to take Introduction to Old English, which was a linguistics course. This not only gave me a new perspective on Beowulf, but it also gave me a new perspective on the English language. Learning Old English helped me to fill in some of the gaps that I had been missing in my own instruction in teaching reading, and it helped to clarify many of the modern-day spelling rules and syntaxes that I currently have to teach in my reading intervention classes. And I'll admit, it was quite the task to diagram, translate, and decode each sentence in this poem from its original Anglo-Saxon. But... I had excellent and patient professors to guide me through, including today's guest. His name is Dr. Larry Swain of Bemidji State University and Signum University. Larry holds an MA in Medieval Studies from the Medieval Institute of Western Michigan University and a PhD from the University of Chicago. He specializes in medieval literature and medieval languages, including, but not limited to, Old English, Ancient Greek, and Latin. His academic work focuses on early medieval presentation and appropriation of classical literature and culture. In addition, he co-edits the journal The Heroic Age, and he has worked on the Old English newsletter and writes about archaeology for the year's work in Old English studies. Larry has published many chapters and articles on Old English poetry and on Beowulf. But what has particularly piqued this podcaster is an upcoming edition from Medieval Institute Publications. Teaching Beowulf, Practical Approaches, co-edited with Dr. Aaron Hofstetter. As soon as I heard that Larry was co-editing this book on teaching Beowulf, I knew I had to get him on the show. And thanks to Larry, I now have a much better understanding of the English language, how the English language works, and what an awesome poem Beowulf is. So, without further ado, here's our conversation. So, my dear Larry, who are you? What do you do? What do you study? And what do you teach? Tell us all about yourself. Ooh, wow. All right. Well, <laughs> 30 seconds or less, right? 
<laughs> yeah. Um, Forget the elevator pitch. Go ahead and give us the full monologue if you the need full, to. The full monologue? Yes. Well, I remember where I came from, right? That phrase that we like to use. Um, but I'm I'm a kid from the wrong side of, uh, in, my, in my case, the wrong side of Central Avenue. Um, right? We came from the, the lower socioeconomic uh, caste. Uh, and my father never finished high school. So, you know, when I declared myself college bound, that created all sorts of interesting things. But but I got there. I got to college and I graduated college and then went on and got a Ph.D. So uh, and I'm very eclectic. So I, I got my B.A. in religion, Greek and linguistics, did some postgraduate work in classics um, and comparative religion uh, and then went on to an M.A. in medieval studies and then a Ph.D. in English. And all of that took me about 30 years. <laughs> uh, and my my area of focus and research is uh, specifically uh, early medieval uh, languages and, and literature, particularly theological literature. Um, but what I teach, <laughs> well, at least at, uh, you know, because I teach at Bemidji State University as well as Signum University. And at uh, Bemidji State, I teach pretty much everything pre-modern. Um so, you know, anything from uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh to uh, I, I usually never get into the uh, the 18th century. I never actually make it that far, though I'm supposed to. But everything to up to Milton uh, uh, is, is what I teach. And then here at Signum in the MA program, uh, I've done, you know, Old English and Beowulf and classical myths and legends and other things. And then I teach in the Insignum Space program, too, where I do a lot of the languages. So right now I'm doing classical Greek and, and doing advanced Old English and beginning Old English. And we've tried a few Latin things. All the good fun stuff. All the good fun stuff. Well, yeah, fun for me anyway. <laughs> well, certainly. And for the students who take your classes, too. As oh, one yeah. who has taken your classes, I can attest to it. I could change right. it, you know. <laughs> oh goodness! So, in a oh. nutshell, that's me. I, in I, a nutshell. I am privileged to uh, do what I love. And oh, good. It's a good thing. It is. That is a fun privilege, isn't it? To be able to do what you love and to teach what you love. Yeah, it's and having best. many years where I didn't get to do that. <laughs> yeah. The drudgery of you know a nine to five job or worse seven thirty to four. No, no fun. No fun whatsoever. What are some of your favorite things to to study and to teach? Since that those appear to be on two opposite sides of the spectrum, right? I, well, not opposite, <laughs> but different, perhaps. Hmm. Well, study wise, I have uh, uh, undertaken a what will be a multi year, perhaps multi decade project. Um, and if you look at at theology or philosophy, uh, right? You go kind of from the classical period and you skip 700 years and, and you pick up with the uh, um, rediscovery, and I'm going to use that in scare quotes, uh, of, of Plato and Aristotle, which were uh, known only as names and in summaries and references uh, in, in Latin in the West until... Uh, we decided to go on crusade. And one of the results of the crusades is that we've, you know, here, here are all these books. They need to be translated from Arabic and Greek back into Latin and made available. So anyway, right. So there's this big gap. Uh, and I think that that is a, a grave mistake. And so I'm, I'm undertaking uh, a, a, a study or a, or a report, right, on what early medieval theology would be. And a large part of what we know about that isn't in the theological treatise, which is one of the reasons why it's skipped over, but it's rather in stories and poems. Mm -hmm. So if we want to talk about, uh, well, what is early medieval, you know, say Christology, you know, the understanding of who that JC fellow was. Uh, you who's know, we, that guy? Who's that guy? Yeah, you might have heard of him. I have no idea. You know, as I tell my students, JC the second, because JC the first died in 45 BC. Mm. Uh, yeah, with knives and, and, and those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so if we want to understand who who that guy is, well, we look at things like uh, the old Saxon poem, The Hellion. We look at like Dream of the Rood. Uh, we look at just the name, Hel you know, Highland in Old English, Helion in, in Old Saxon, uh, which stems from the verb to heal. So what, what's going on with that? Uh, right. And so we look at those kinds of things. 
rather than some kind of treatise like Augustine of Hippo, you know, here's what that Jesus guy was all about. And, or, or, you know, a, a church council that gives us a creed, right? Those oh yeah. That, that old creed. Yeah. That old Nicene thingy. So that's what, that's, that's what I'm doing in, in terms of study right now. That's wonderful. I love that you're focusing on stories as someone, I like history, but I love stories. So I, yeah. and as a lapsed Catholic, the stories were always my favorite part. I, I, I like to call it recovering Catholic. <laughs> yeah. Long and complicated history. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mine too. I, I was raised Catholic as well. So I know we're still recovering. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. first of all, what do I, what do I love to teach? That's, that's hard. Um, mm. It's hard to choose, right? Because I mm. love teaching my languages. So that's, you know, that that's always fun. Um, but, our, you know, like, gosh darn it, got to talk about Tolkien. Uh, <laughs> right, as Tolkien observed long ago, right? You can't just study the language. You've got to, you know, there's people who are telling stories in those languages. And so, you know, I, I, I teach a lot of stories. I love stories. Hey, and one of our favorite stories, one that you uh, taught me once upon a time ago, <laughs> and actually recently again in a space course too. So twice yeah. upon a time ago, we love talking about Beowulf. We do. We, we do. do. So to know Beowulf, we kind of have to, we have to know Old English, aka Anglo-Saxon. So what are some of the benefits of studying Old English? Why should we learn it? Why should we teach it? It's it's also, it's just not something that I ever had any exposure to in my undergrad or in my master's work until I got to Signum. And that, for me personally, that really helped me, but I'd love to hear your perspective on why it's so important to know and understand Anglo-Saxon, not just for the poem, but for other reasons as well. So do, do tell, do tell. Do tell, all right. Um, well, you know, and, and sadly, it's it's increasingly the case um, that undergraduates or, or even high school, let's not even talk about high schools, uh, will not be introduced to Old English or anything like that at all. But what are the advantages? Well, some of them are general, right? Uh, uh, studying another language or an earlier form of another language uh, has all kinds of benefits in terms of understanding your own language, in terms of, of developing empathy and insight into other cultures, um, right? All those things that, that are benefits of studying a language pertain to Old English. The advantage of Old English is that unlike, say, Latin and Greek, and I'm not disparaging those because I love those <laughs> too, uh, or even modern German, French, Spanish, Chinese, Mandarin, I should say, uh, Klingon, uh, is that, uh, you know, you can ma master the basics of Old English, especially if you're a Germanic language speaker, within, you know, the equivalent of a college semester. And then, you know, usually the sequence uh, is, you know, you take your, your introductory Old English course, and then the next semester you're jumping right into Beowulf, which is undoubtedly no argument, the most challenging text in, in written in Old English. So, you know, that's that's pretty good um, because, you know, thinking back to uh, to taking, uh, you know, Greek, uh, you know, after two years of Greek um, and then, you know, jumping into Homer um, kind of kicked my bum. Um, it was difficult. It was really difficult. I, I did a lot of work uh, just to get a few lines of the Iliad uh, translated. Uh, so right, I mean, so so the difference, there, the advantage to old English as opposed to to other languages, uh, is is that you can master it much more quickly and and gain access into the texts. There's also aesthetics. I'm going to mention that one. I almost forgot that one. But aesthetics, right? It's beautiful. Um, I am very proud uh, to say that uh, constantly on student evaluations, um, right? The the students mention that when I come in, quote, you know reciting Beowulf, uh, which I'm not really reciting it, I'm just uh, reading it from a text, but reciting Beowulf, and, and they think it's so cool right, to, to have this old English uh, thrown at them, even if they don't understand what's going on. But but it's beautiful. It's There's there's just something really moving about that. 
can't discount aesthetics. And it is, it is a very beautiful language. And I, there definitely is something to say for, for jumping into the deep end of the pool, as it were, if you're going to, if you're going to start <laughs> with, if you're going to learn a language, you might as well dive into the most complicated text because, you know, baptism by fire usually works. It does indeed. Indeed. We do. I do love Beowulf. It's a great, I did love it when I was in high school without the Anglo-Saxon context, but I think the Anglo-Saxon context really helped me understand it even better um especially through your class class. i i'm gonna (laughs) i'm gonna pile it on i am and i'm not gonna lie about it so then what does anglo-saxon slash old english reveal about us in the modern day whether that's linguistically or socially how do these roots speak to us in the modern day um well for one thing you know if you're an english speaker Right. That's obviously the, this is the roots of our own of our own language. And while, you know, people want to want to, you know, downplay the influence of Old English by saying like about 26 percent of the words in the English language stem from Old English, which would be true in our modern language, which has well over 6000 morphemes uh, in it that we've either borrowed or developed. Uh, and those kinds of things. But of those 26%, right, 85 to 95, depending on who you talk to, percent of our daily, everyday words that we use the most often come from Old English, right? So learning Old English, uh, right, gives you the roots of the language that we speak. And of course, language is a huge part uh, of our culture and our worldview uh, and uh, view about our relationships, right, the vocabulary that we use. Uh, so, so it's it really gives you a an insight into who we are as as a people, right? And we can extend that more generally. Old English has one of the Germanic languages, so it also you know gives you kind of the roots of of modern German or Norwegian or Icelandic because these are all related languages. Listeners can't see me, but uh, Larry can see me nodding emphatically as he's talking. <laughs> as a reading specialist who works with students who need that explicit ex- instruction in those morphological roots, in those morphemes. I mean, m- most of the morphemes that I'm teaching right now are Anglo-Saxon morphemes. And they always really? giggle when I say morpheme. And they're like, what's that? What's a morpheme? I'm like, I tell you this every week. <laughs> That's every right. Every week, but my loves. Well, here's a strategy for you. Mm-hmm. Make mm-hmm. them look it up. You told it, You told it to them last week. Right. So open note question. What's a morpheme? Look it up. I have it on a poster right there for them. Yeah. Practice reading. Practice reading the poster. Exactly. I do have a small group who likes to play teacher. So once we Uh, finish with all the things we have to do, they they play teacher for for five minutes at the end. And it's adorable. (laughs) It's adorable. They point to all my anchor charts. It's great. It is. I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that. You know that you won when they point to morpheme and. (laughs) <laughs> and they tell me what it means yes for those of you who don't know listeners a morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning in a word smallest unit of meaning oh, i right. love my so, job yeah right i always use the example example of un, right? un. You, at the beginning of a word it's not a word but mm-hmm. it is a morpheme it definitely has meaning and it has meaning look at that look at our buddy our buddy unferth Oh, yes. Everybody, unfirth. Unfirth. <laughs> unfirth. Unfriend. He is not your friend. That's um, right. Despite the fact that he gives us a shiny. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Speaking of, how about Beowulf? How, how about, about Beowulf? our? How about Beowulf? So how is it that this story continues to resonate with modern readers? Does it, you know, does it belong in an ivory tower? Should we continue to study it? Like, what is it? How does it keep coming back to us? Or why does it keep coming back yeah. to us? All right. Well, the, many questions there, Elise. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe I should start with uh, with talking about my own um, um, experience with the poem uh, and how silly I was. <laughs> um, I didn't really, you know, it, it was not part of my secondary education at all, or even my undergraduate education. Uh Right. I mean, I was kind of vaguely aware of this Beowulf thing, but didn't really know anything about it. And, you know, during, I would say, the late 80s uh, into the 90s, it started to get more cultural attention. 
Um, more people were talking about it and should it be part of the curriculum, yada, yada, yada. And I pretty much just avoided it and ignored all that until uh, I was working at a library and uh, the director of the library started a public access show. So various of our staffs would, you know, come on the show and do the show and in terms of the behind the scenes stuff, but, you know, be on camera. And one of the really exciting things uh, in the early days of the internet is that um, Paul Sharbeck, who later became my master's director, but at the time he was the uh, new new head of the Medieval Institute at Western Michigan University at uh, Kalamazoo, and Kevin Kiernan, who was at the University of Kentucky, uh, got permission uh, and, and assistance from the British Library to digitally photograph the Beowulf manuscript for the first time. And they made those images publicly available on a server at Western Michigan. That really piqued my curiosity. I had to go look at these images and I put them on the public access show and said, this is how you get it. This is really cool, this thousand year old manuscript. So learning about the manuscript and being able to see it really is what kind of got me anyway into uh, falling in love with the poem. And then, you know, reading it and and the language and the uh, all the themes, you know, and every time I read it, I, I find something new. Uh, to talk about or to think about uh, some new aspect. So does it belong in the ivory tower? Absolutely not. And we've already seen uh, how important that crossover is uh, with some success and some not so successful, right? But starting in about 2000, we suddenly had um, a plethora of of new translations, the one by Seamus Haney, one by Roy Liuza, um, you know, all the way up to, what was it, 19, 20, 21, somewhere in there uh, with uh, Headley's new translation, right? So there's obviously people who are very interested in the poem, uh, translating the poem, and those translations are hitting bestseller lists. So there's obviously people out there uh, who want to read it, and they're not all just sitting in an ivory tower with their door locked and and mumbling over, you know, old English and manuscripts and <laughs> things like that. And of course, we've had movies. Um, you know, it's, it's been, what, 12 years now since the, uh, uh, what is lovingly called the Game and Wolf uh, uh, <laughs> live action with Roy Winston and Angelina Jolie and, and such. Um, yeah. So we're That's... probably, we're probably, you know, fit for a, for a new movie, new Beowulf movie. Hopefully it'll be better than the 1999 Christopher Lambert travesty of a oh, movie. Boy. <laughs> right now we had a tv yeah. show loosely based on beowulf what was it called oh uh the executioner or something like that that was oh. you know, and related to beowulf we had last year's northman uh movie this is true right, this is true which was based on uh snorri sturleson's hamlet uh tale which mm. became the basis for hamlet right so there's very obvious uh the viking show uh which took some stuff from beowulf too TV show that uh, ended a few years ago. So there's very obviously in our culture interest in these things mm -hmm. uh, and and in this literature. Whether yeah. they want to learn Old English, they should, but whether they want to or not, uh, to access the poem is a different question. But but obviously this uh, this literature still speaks to people and it still mm -hmm. piques their interest. Yes, so that's and good. it's it's certainly a good access point to the language and vice versa. Absolutely. Um, and I have noticed, I was peeking into, um, I think it was Bruce Gilchrist who wrote this, uh, Beowulf is Children's Literature yes, text, and yeah. that one. And I just, and just in the introduction, I noticed uh, the, the it, Beowulf seems to be really rife for various forms of adaptation, whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, a TV show or a graphic novel or a film, um, it's, it's it, it's propensity for for adaptation seems to be really you know this is something that people really enjoy diving into through various lenses whether it's linguistic poetic the manuscript whatever it might be it it's a more dynamic text than it might appear to be to the layman on the surface yeah so so since you plugged brett bruce's and uh, brett's book uh which just came out this year i think earlier this year uh another uh book um just stop this uh, this year is uh, Beowulf in the Comics by Richard Scott Noakes from McFarland, I think. So I think another I one it. to pick up. Mm -hmm. All right, another one. I I do love asking my my interview people, uh, my interviewees for sources. So adding that to the source list 
<laughs> Beowulf in the comics. I love it. I'm pretty sure that's the title. N O K E S is the author's uh, last name. So if you just look up Richard Scott Noakes, I think I've I think I've seen that name. So I yeah. shall I shall. Um, might not be that person, particular person. It could be a different Noakes, you know. But brain, brain is brain. Well, there is, of course, Tolkien's. Uh, you know. Um, that's it. Noakes. That from, Noakes. Uh, from Smith of Wooden Major. Yeah, yes. Certainly there cannot be the story. It's one of my favorite Tolkien stories. I like it even better than uh, Lord of the Rings, I have to admit. It's it's a really good story. It's a really good fairy story. So what are some of the things that you've discovered in your study of the Beowulf text, whether that's the manuscript or the story overall, that, that have surprised you? What, what surprises you about the Beowulf story? Um... One of the things I think uh, that that I, I would talk about is uh, the importance of the female characters, and this is not, you know, something that has been a major part of interpretation until of the poem until very recently. Uh, but you know, I come from a very long line of strong pioneer women settling in, you know, the Western United States. Um, so, you know, looking at the at the female characters in the poem who don't get large parts and they're not out fighting monsters and stuff, but boy, do they have power and they exercise that power. They've got no problem. You know, well, the comes up, it's, you know, Hrothgar, you can't have Beowulf as your heir. You got two sons here. You've got your nephew there. Shut up and sit down. <laughs> you know, she doesn't say it like that. Of course, she, you don't use this very courtly language. But nonetheless, she's basically telling the king he's in the wrong to make such an offer. Um, and he seems to back down because Beowulf leaves <laughs> with, you know, with presents. Uh, and of course, one of the things in Beowulf, sorry, I'm getting excited, uh, you know, is the whole in, image of a good king is is a ring giver, right? He, The good king gives gifts and in return, uh, the warrior or the thane, right, swears swears his loyalty um, and, and all of that good stuff. Uh, and we see that with Hrothgar, we see that with Beowulf. Uh, right, we have the criticism of another king, Haramode, who was stingy. So we don't, you know, he's a bad king. Um, we see it with Hugalak, Beowulf's uncle, when he returns from from uh, the da fighting the Danes. Uh, but we see it also with the female characters. Wealthiel gives Beowulf gifts, right, and says, "I'm sure you will treat my sons well. Here, have this nice, expensive present." <laughs> Uh, right. So the same kind of relationship between uh, Hrothgar, Hrothgar and Beowulf. Right. You do this for me. You get all these gifts. Right. We've, we've got this this sacred exchange going on is also going on between Wealthiel and Beowulf. And same thing later with uh, with Hig, uh, um, his aunt in law, if you will, <laughs> Hugalak's wife. Right. He gives her gifts as well. And she gives him. And she wants to give him the throne. He he turns it down, but right there's an exchange there too. Uh, so so it's really interesting, I think. And then, and that was one of the things that when I first started studying the poem, kind of surprised me is is how first that it was there uh, to be talked about, but second how uh, well misogynist <laughs> criticism had been because they really hadn't been talking about that. I do love that she's. She, she tells the king to sit down. Yeah. <laughs> we all think she's always been my favorite character, even in high school. Yeah. And I didn't, yeah. I mean, and to be fair, I read the Burton Raffle translation. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I know. I knew, I knew I mean, you would say that. It's easily accessible for a high school audience. But, yeah. I, I don't, I, that was before Seamus Heaney's time. Uh, so okay. that's, that's why. That's how old I am, apparently. Um, the... But I do well, that's remember a, that's really, okay. My first encounter with the poem was uh, the Donaldson translation, and, Donaldson and it's a very translation. accurate translation. But it's prose and it's plotting and it put students to sleep. Yeah, no, we we need more rousing, yay to to Beowulf because there is lots of rousing yay in Beowulf. Mm -hmm. There's there's there lots of fun stuff. Yeah, I will say that for the the fifth graders. I brought my uh, version of the new, um, newest uh, graphic novel version of Beowulf, of Beowulf, mm. the one uh, where it's uh, it's it's basically like the codename Kids Next Door version, where it's all ah. kids, all kids versus the oh. adult Grendel, and um, 
Hey, um, Herod is basically a giant tree house and Rothgar is like the king of all the kids in the neighborhood. And it's adorable. It's an adorable book and they're starting to like it, but it, it does occur to me like the, they really emphasize the sharing of toys and the sharing of bubble gum and treats that put you that, you know, make you want to throw up after, you know, consuming them all. Um, the gift giving is really important throughout. And I'm glad that this particular artist and translator of this particular graphic novel emphasized that because that is it is really it really is a sign of power in Beowulf I, and I didn't notice that in my first reading until you pointed it out to me oh wonderful teacher <laughs> oh go on no I really do. go on <laughs> really really go on <laughs> thank then, you <laughs> what has surprised you the most in your discoveries as you've taught Beowulf has anything kind of jumped out at you as you've taught it, that made you say, oh, that's not something I really noticed before. So maybe I need to go back and research this yeah. or something a student said to you or um, discovered that you thought, hey, you could be onto something. What do you think? That's a difficult question again. Got to think about that one. Um, I would say that in teaching the poem, because I taught it at different levels, right? Um, not in high school, but, but you know, I've taught it to undergraduates. Uh, at at uh, both the you know the survey level here we are um, and trying to make connections right one of the things I like to do in my teaching uh, particularly when we're doing a survey thing is you know how does how does this fit in with that right how does Beowulf for example fit in um, with early Irish lyrics and with Chaucer and with you know and how 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 different what are the differences what are the continuities those kinds of things and then. You know, I've ha I have an upper division course called The Worlds of Beowulf in which I, you know, try to introduce students to the different ways into the poem. Uh, and then, of course, on the graduate level in Old English and in, in translation. So so I've taught it at many different points. And I think I think one of the things um, I'm not sure that it's a, it's a thing that I've learned, but one of the things that I really, really appreciate, I think, is that so many students uh, that have come through my classes have had some kind of introduction to Beowulf in, in high school. And so when they see that it's on the syllabus for this class, it's a groan, you know, oh, not that, you know, old chestnut, oh, blah, blah. which tells me, right, that there's a problem with the teaching of the poem out there in the public uh, in, and in high schools and such. So one of the things that, that surprises me, right, Surprise, maybe not the right word, but surprises me is that once they encounter the poem in in my class, that uh, most, not all, but most come out really uh, appreciating and loving the poem. And, at least, and those who don't come out loving it at least have a better understanding and a, and a better appreciation. They no longer roll their eyes and groan uh, at the mention of Beowulf. <laughs> so, so, you know, something's got to be done. Um to, yeah. to rectify that because yeah. it really is a a fabulous piece of literature it is and it does show that you must be doing something right if <laughs> they're coming out of it enjoying it when before they were rolling their eyes and groaning and yeah. i think if i may you are doing something about it yeah trying to because you're publishing a book about it yes uh, so yeah the story of that is is kind of what i was just saying is that noticing that there are students who um, you know, just hated the poem uh, "Cub Again," which tells me something about how they're being, how it's being taught to them. Um, and a lot of my students are um, um, education students, right? They're getting a, a bachelor of science in English education. Uh, so at some point, they're going to go out and they're going to, you know, teach this poem. Uh, so, but you know, at best they've had the British literature survey. And so they had, I take four days, right. Which is unusual. Most people maybe take three days uh, on teaching Beowulf. Um, I take four, but you know, still they've had four class periods to learn the poem. And then they have to go out and teach it to high schools or middle school uh, students. So that was the inspiration of the book is that, you know, there are either these really two simple introductions you know, an encyclopedia article or, you know, a few paragraphs here or there or Wikipedia. Uh, or there's something that's way too advanced for the high school or community college instructor who's, you know, had three class periods on the poem and now has to teach it. Um, 
So there's got to be something in, in, in between. And so uh, started this this idea of, well, let's, uh, I was going to do it myself originally. Uh, and uh, let's, let's, you know, have a book of chapters that gives them basic inroads into the poem, right? D- different ways of, of, of getting in there, depending on, you know, their students and what they like and their the teacher's own interest, uh, but also include lesson plans. No other other guide to Beowulf has done that, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and then I attended a, a National Endowment for the Humanities seminar uh, on, well, guess what? Beowulf, what else? <laughs> uh, and so then I said, you know, uh, uh, kind of, well, what if I get, you know, as many of these people as possible to contribute chapters. Um, and I picked up a co-editor, Dr. Aaron, Aaron Hostetter at Rutgers. And the idea is that these chapters are written by people um, who are not at big tier one universities, you know, are not big names in the field, but are people who are in, you know, advanced high schools or middle schools or community colleges who are teaching the poem in those contexts. Um, and and how they teach it, right? Uh, various inroads uh, into that, um, and then you know here are some suggested lesson plans that teachers can adapt and use in the classroom, and they're all more or less student driven, right? Uh, so it's not teacher up there giving lecture, um, but you know student driven kinds of of exercises that get into the poem, uh, and so I'm I'm very proud with uh, with the result. It's in the publisher's hands now, so. Uh, scheduled at least on their website for spring. Uh, oh, hooray! So yeah, so I'm I'm really happy with it. There's some really great material in there. Uh, everything from traditional stuff like the language and the manuscript and uh, those kinds of kinds of issues to right. Um, we have uh, an author talking about the women in the poem and another author talking about nature, eco criticism, as we like to call it in academia. So yeah, and and we have another author who's talking about uh, homoeroticism and and uh, same sex relationships of various kinds in the poem. Uh, so yeah, so we've got you know kind of running the gamut from from you know new stuff to old stuff and back again, uh, and ways uh, and how that helps us get into the poem. Uh, so I'm really hoping it'll be a really excellent resource for for teachers. I. And you know, I did. I had different various faces going on as I kept my <laughs> microphone muted, as you saw. I mean, I am so excited for this as a teacher. As a teacher, I'm so excited. Mike, we need and ev- no teacher. You can is edit this out, but my concern is is going to be the cost because you know there's like 15 essays um, <sighs> at at 12 to 15 pages each. Some of them a little longer, so yeah. it's it's likely to be a a, a pricey pricey book which that is, is the unfortunate downside of the ivory tower is it's a very yeah. expensive tower so it is we and, and the sure. thing is the tower doesn't benefit from it right mm. <laughs> the publishers do but, yeah. but the tower doesn't the tower doesn't it's the publishers yeah. but we shall find a way we shall we shall always find a way i'm sure um and you know as you were talking about that you know as you were talking about the different methods and getting the poem to the people, as it were, to the teachers and therefore to the students, it, I was suddenly reminded of Tolkien's lecture, The Monsters and the Critics. It, this is a really great way of fulfilling Tolkien's vision of getting the poem to everyone and getting the poem to those who would appreciate it because, you know, it's one thing to look at the poem in the way that Tolkien's you know he was criticizing people for looking at it he's like no this is not the right way that we look at the poem and only you snotty people of this particular academic board are looking at it but this is how it should be looked at so that everyone can read it everyone can see it he kind he was kind of the the one who maybe not the one but he started getting it to the high school and to the university like he made it the poem a poem worthy of study didn't he in monsters of the critics so in a way larry you are continuing tolkien's work (laughs) that is high praise Uh, i will admit that you know i'm I'm blushing you can't the people (laughs) hearing this can't see that but i but i'm blushing but uh, yeah, I, I encountered that. I didn't encounter Tolkien until uh, I was an undergraduate, and and I encountered that essay. So perhaps that's the acorn that has grown into the tree. Yeah. 
he is he that is a great acorn and you are growing a great tree i am so excited to read this book i will spend all the money on it and i think this is going to be a really valuable resource Woo, one sale <laughs> yay one sale that's all we need no no we need a few more than that but honestly i'm so excited and i'm excited that you found a way to you've taken your students feedback and turned it into a resource like you you really took to their message and you said okay this is a need this is something that not only do teachers need but students need in order so that we don't you know go groaning into the college university course um and you know look at this poem for two or three days and it's just something you check off the syllabus this is this is great ah i'm so excited for this larry i don't know if you can tell but i'm excited me too (laughs) this is awesome i got got all excited again just talking about it (laughs) right right (laughs) <laughs> oh man if i can get my fifth graders to read beowulf even if it's the code name kids next door graphic novels version of it then i'm a happy teacher i'm yeah. a very happy teacher well and there's i have not read them yet but i have been made aware of a comic book series called kid beowulf yes I i'm gonna include that in the show notes too because i've i've taken a glance at the website and it's it's quite clever okay. i think yeah um yeah it looks like it so i i, I ordered a, uh, the the first volume of the first <laughs> comic book Hooray. Huzzah. Excellent. Huzzah. So what advice do you, I mean, you're, we're, you're, we're going to get this advice in the book, but for now, as a small preview, what advice do you typically give to your students who are teachers who ask you about how Beowulf should be taught? Like what's some of the, what are, what are some of the methods that you personally would, would share with students? Um, is there, clearly you don't think there's one way to teach it, um, no. but is, mm-hmm. um, how do, how do you think, what advice do you give to your students? How do you think it can or should be taught? Hmm. Loaded question, I know. Yeah, well, very loaded question. And part of that, uh, part of the answer uh, is one I cannot answer. But as teachers, I think what we need to need to do is we need to uh, know who our, who our audience is, who's, who, who are our students. Um, and Sometimes we, you know, we can lay out all the lesson plans we want, but we've got to kind of adjust those lesson plans to the people in front of us uh, and and what's going to grab them, what's going to be of interest to them. And hopefully by the time you get to Beowulf, you've got some idea uh, of of these students and, and what are the things that are of interest to them. So, yeah, some of that is is going to be tailored by what what are the students like? Or at least the students you can reach, right? There are some who are going to tune you out just because, you know. For me, I think one of the big, big ways to teach the poem is is make the students read the poem, right? And then ask them, okay, what what do you see? And and out of that kind of questioning, especially in the beginning of the poem, right? They'll come up with stuff, and then you can take that and explore it further. Right. So they'll say, well, there's this woman in here or, you know, well, why is Grendel so upset? And right, a lot of modern takes on the Grendel question, why is Grendel attacking the Danes is, well, you know, there are several takes that have Hrothgar be his super secret daddy, uh, including the the game. Robert Zemeckis. Yes. Um, And, uh, you know, there are others, um, the 2005 uh, Beowulf and Grendel poem that has well the Danes you know killed his father so he's just he's just seeking vengeance of course none of that is in the poem right that's modern importing to try to explain Grendel's behavior um, but but yeah so so addressing Grendel's behavior why is Grendel pissed why if Beowulf is a is a yayot from over in southern Sweden uh, why are we talking about the Danes at the beginning of the poem and you know particularly Shield Sheffing right? Who, the taker of many meat benches. Yeah, who's the shield shopping guy, and why do we care about him? Hmm. Mm. But he's in the poem, so he must be in there for a reason. He's in the poem, yeah. Right? And some people have speculated that uh, the kingdom of East Anglia in early medieval England had ties to the uh, the Sheffing dynasty, right? Right, which was a, a real thing. We know about the, uh, what, uh, what in Old Norse is the skewing dynasty uh, headquartered on the island of zealand uh, in the fifth sixth century excuse me sixth century late fifth century early sixth so we know that they really existed and that they're really there and that 
you know, maybe Beowulf was composed or at least preserved in East Anglia because of the political connections between the Schuffing dynasty and and uh, the Wolfing dynasty in in uh, in East Anglia. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe very. If we're talking about absolutely, some people like to take the 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 myth the mythic uh, aspect, right? Shield seems like a warrior god, right? Shield, uh, and Sheffing is a is sheaf, modern sheaf, uh, like a sheaf of grain, uh, and would be a, a some kind of of food god or fertility god, right? As it pertains to, you know, the stuff that you need to stay alive, food. <laughs> Kind of important. Be, and so kind of important, right? So you stick to, you know, well, here's this shield chefing guy who's got these divine names and he comes from, you know, only the gods know where uh, and, and comes and be, becomes, you know, from, from waif to great war leader and then out to sea and nobody knows what happens to him either. Um, right? it's, it's rife with, with good mythos. And the classroom is a great place to experiment with that. Yeah present all these perspectives, see what we're, what we're into as students and then play with that poem. That's great. Yeah. And I can keep going if you want. <laughs> oh, indeed. I'm sure. Yeah. Let's hit it. Let's do one more. I love it. Yeah. All right. Do, so do. one of the great things about epic sorts of literature and other sorts of literature, but really comes across in epics is this whole interplay of, of history and legend and myth and folklore. And it's all kind of whopped together into one big, wonderful ball. Uh, and Beowulf is absolutely that, right? There there are things uh, that even still um, in the 23rd, 21st century, not 23rd yet, that's Star Trek, uh, the 21st century, uh, you know, that, that we're still playing with. I mean, Tom Shippey recently wrote a, a short book about the history, right? What can we, what can we pull out uh, of the poem that tells us about a period that we really don't otherwise have a whole lot of written information about, right? So, right, we're still doing that. We're still talking about the history. And obviously there's legend. Who is this Beowulf guy? He doesn't really show up in any other texts that we know of, right? There's some speculation that one of the late sagas, uh, the saga of Hrof Kraki and the character of both Barb uh, might be another version of Beowulf, right? Drawing on the same kind of uh, traditional material, Right, so how does the legend play into that? So we've got the history, we've got the legend, we've got this this wonderful language um, going on. We've got uh, definitely myth, right? Shield chefing uh, is is just one type of myth, uh, and then we've got Grendel and Grendel's mom, and you know sometimes the poem attaches words like troll and aglack weef, uh, um, and and those kinds of terms that kind of suggest that they are not human or not quite human but then on the you know other times the poet uh, gives them descriptions that are very human um and so what are they how do we how do we pin pin them to say well this is this is uh, human or this is superhuman or this is something other entirely um you know and certainly a thinking dragon at the end of the poem <laughs> uh who does Never. not like to be robbed <laughs> never forget the dragon and never never, forget the dragon. never rob the dragon. Yeah, Very bad too. idea. That too. Don't do that. In fact, you might want to give him presents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As someone with a toddler whose nickname is Small Dragon, giving presents slash snacks is a very good idea. It indeed. But oh, that dragon. <laughs> I mean, there's a reason why it's, you know, Tolkien drew the picture and we put it on the right. cover of his translation of Beowulf is right. very, very important. We didn't even get to that in the Tolkien translation, did we? We didn't. Oh, sad face. Oh, oh. I know. Um, but there's just so much to this poem, and we're still talking about it. So there's something, something yeah. to be said for it, for sure. Oh, thank you for that, Larry. That was wonderful. Now, to another important question that I I always ask my or not always, but I typically ask the people that I chat with on Teaching with Magic, in your opinion, what is the value of fantasy? Why oh, should no. <laughs> fantasy... I know, I'm hitting you with all the big ones, aren't I? Yeah. I am. <laughs> so we, you kind of answered this a bit in, in, your, in respect to Beowulf, but why should fantasy be taught in the classroom? Well, modern mo if we're talking about fantasy in terms of the modern genre, at least the good stuff. 
<laughs> um, modern fantasy has in 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 most ways uh, replaced uh, myth and and epic and right the romance genre from the medieval ages and right those kinds of stories that were just part and parcel of the culture of, of the time well fantasy has now become that uh and certainly you know what's uh, i mean tolkien was certainly instrumental he wasn't the first fantasy writer but he was certainly instrumental uh in in establishing that as a as a genre in in our culture uh and for decades right the the ivory tower <laughs> uh ignored uh or poo-pooed uh tolkien and now you know he's become mainstream uh with two journals that i'm aware of and two or three different society you know professional societies specifically to to study tolkien which means right that the subsequent fantasy literature has now also become a subject of of academic study uh which means it's it's culturally accepted so that's one that's one value uh, one, another value is that you know we've always told if we if we're going all the way back to Gilgamesh and Humbaba and Utnapishtim, um, right? One of the the earliest uh, texts that we have uh, in human history. There there were probably other stories uh, long before that, but that's the first one that you know that we have record of. Uh, we've got the fantastic, and we can use the fantastic to uh, be a mirror on ourselves. Right, things that we may not say in a in a novel or in an essay or even a TV show that you know might get censored, <laughs> uh, we can do in fantasy literature and and hold up that mirror and say, this this is us, and you know ha having an understanding of who we are, right, we can hopefully resolve some of our some of our problems and not pass them on to the next generation. So read more fantasy. <laughs> I love that message. Yay. <laughs> ah, best message. Anyone, anyone can tell me. Thank you for that, Larry. It's it's so very, very true. T fantasy teaches teaches us more about ourselves than reality, I think. But that's my personal opinion, folks. So uh, of, of I all that opinion. It's thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, we've talked about a couple, but of all the uh, Beowulf adaptations and translations out there, which one is your personal favorite? And which one do you recommend the most, perhaps professionally, like of, of all the ones, like which one do you perhaps uh, to specify the question a little bit, which one do you think you think is, oh, this is awesome. I love this one versus, okay, this is the one I recommend perhaps for accuracy or for, um, or maybe those two go together. Yeah. All right. Well, well, for for accuracy of translation and readability, mm. um, I recommend Roy Liuza's uh, Beowulf from Broadview Press. Came okay. out just months after uh, uh, Haney's translation, but right, uh, Roy is uh, is a real old English scholar, um, and also tried to 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 be poetic and beautiful about it. Um, Right, whereas Haney had taken Old English when he was in college, right, and decades later, finally finished his uh, a translation of it, right, which is absolutely beautiful and wonderful. I love Haney's translation, um, but so yeah, so those are the two that I would probably recommend the most in terms of modern English uh, translations. Um, there's a couple of online ones uh, that I should mention. Um, a long time. Uh, on the web is um, Benjamin Slade's uh, translations at herwrote.dk. Um, very useful website for, for students of the poem. Uh, and then uh, my co-editor of the book, uh, Aaron Hostetter, has a really great project uh, called the Old English Narrative Poetry Project. Uh, so he has translated all the poetry in Old English, uh, and it's up on his site. And some he's tried. Right? So he's been experimenting off and on with um, uh, doing a um, doing a non excuse me a non traditional translation of Beowulf, which is you know interesting. I'm not sure I would teach that, <laughs> but it is certainly interesting uh, interesting to read. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's what I would recommend. In terms of translations, adaptations, 
Well, it depends on what you mean by adaptation, <laughs> right? Uh, or, yeah, perhaps um, written adaptation, graphic yeah. novel, uh, written translation, um, and then maybe conversely talk about some films that you like. But I was thinking of a written adaptation written, when I made this well, question. Yeah, the first thing I would say, and I know uh, there be though there will be some people who would uh, disagree with me, but do not. Do not take uh, John Gardner's Grendel as an adaptation of Beowulf. It uses Noted. the plot points of the poem, poem. It uses character names of the poem, but it is not Beowulf. Got it. John Grendel. Gardner's Grendel. Got it. Yeah, okay. It. That's it's an interesting read, but it's more it's more of a critique of Sartre uh, and uh, existentialism than it is. Uh, an adaptation of Beowulf. His his intent is not to retell the Beowulf story. Okay, it's an intent. His intent is to retell Sartre using Grendel, yeah, yeah. a character. Right. Okay, I mean, I can you know appreciate that reading, just not as an adaptation of Beowulf. Okay, yeah. So it's a really interesting novel. Read it, but it is not Beowulf. Um, so the the best um adaptation in terms of of written text that I think I have seen is uh back ooh well back in the 90s i think late 90s park goodwin or godwin uh g o o d w i n uh, who was a fantasy writer uh and then late uh, in in his career he started retelling you know classic tales and he has an adaptation uh or you know a novelization of beowulf um and you know explains some of the questions why is why is grendel pissed uh you know what do you do with Grendel's mother to, you know, refer to the sound of music? Uh, <laughs> you know, how does it fit into this, this kind of Northern Germanic context, um, and et cetera, et cetera. And I, I, you know, I, obviously he's going to have to do some interpretation of, of issues in the poems and pick, you know, one interpretation or another. Um, and while I disagree with some of those interpretations, the way that he uh, uh, molds those into his story, I think is really good. Uh, and so, you know, it's been out a few years. I think it's, I forget what it's called now. If I ran, ran down to the basement and pulled out that box, I could tell you. <laughs> but Park Godwin is the guy's name. P-A-R-K-E is his first name. And then Park Godwin. I will look that up. I will look that up. And hopefully if it's available, I can add it to the show notes and add it to my bookshop list of book yeah. recommendations i have a list that i got yeah, a list of book you know, recommendations it's, it's, from the podcast it's in paperback um and has been for a long time so you could probably pick it up for pennies uh at this point or, or at least a couple of bucks um as far as the graphic novels i am not as up on the graphic novels as i would like to be there are some good ones out there um there is one. What was his name? I can see. I can see the cover and the artwork. It was just wonderful. And I, now I can't think of his name. Um, but it's about you know yay thick. I want to say Greg something. Uh, Gareth Hines. Gareth Hines. Yes. Yes. Uh, I That's a very that popular artwork. one. That yeah. artwork is. It just made my eyes pop. Uh, yeah. I thought, was, I thought it was just so good. I um, wanted to but, recommend it to some of my ten-year-old students, but then yeah. I saw how bloody it was in the inside, and I thought some parents might be mad at me for this. But yeah, little little trigger, trigger warning goes a long way. <laughs> yeah, just there's a little blood, bit. But, there's gore. Yeah. Eh, yeah, you know what are you gonna do about that? But yes, Gareth Hines, very good. Love that one. I will. Yeah, I'll Greg definitely. Gareth, you know, same thing. Greg, <laughs> it's a G. There you go. What are you gonna do about it? Now, you ready for a surprise lightning round question? Oh, we haven't talked about movies yet. We haven't. Oh, true. We haven't talked. Would you like to recommend a movie for? Well, there aren't enough of them. No. <laughs> I would say that, you know, we had, we had that spate of movies um, um, in the, in the aughts mm. uh, or, you know, the 1999 Christopher Lambert, not Beowulf. It's really fun as C grade uh, fantasy movie. <laughs> But it's not Beowulf. No. <laughs> um, but of, of the movies, I think my favorite is Beowulf and Grendel. Uh, mm. With uh, what's his name with the the six pack uh, from from three hundred. Uh, <laughs> what? That's um, Bugger. I love that guy. Yeah, that and guy. And I'm blanking on his name. <laughs> Me too. I can see his face, but that didn't help. <laughs> he was in Phantom of the Opera. He was that I, too. Yeah. 
I'm going to think of it as soon as we hang up. I know of I course. am. Of course. That's the way it works. Um, um, Sarah Polly is also in it, uh, who's been a long time one of my favorite actresses. Um, I, and I like what they do with her. Uh, mm mm-hmm. Because it's like they took the poem, The Wife's Lament, right, which is about a woman who has been exiled uh, from her husband's community. And her husband is off doing stuff, fighting, raiding. As husbands do, apparently. As husbands do, right? Uh, and and so she's on the outside of, of this community. Well, that's kind of what Sarah Polly's character is. And so it's like they took that poem and invented a, uh, a character to stick into the Beowulf story um, for her. Uh, so I think that's fascinating. Of course, the landscape. The landscape is as much as a character uh, and as important as plot uh, in this movie. So I really, I really like that one. Gerard Butler. Gerard Butler. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Sick brain. Sick brain. It's catching up. It's catching up. Yes, I remember watching that a few years ago and really liking it. Yes, I, I, it's, it's on Prime. I think it's still on Prime. Actually. I think it's on Prime. Yeah. So I, you know what? Clearly, I'm going to need to recover a little bit more from my sickness. <laughs> so <clears throat> I suppose if I must watch some TV, if I must. If you must. If I must. Yeah. All right. There's my homework assignment. Watch Beowulf and That's Grendel right. again. Yes. I remember That's really right. well, enjoying I that think, I think we need another podcast at some point rating all the movies. I think we should. Yeah. Just have an entire entire Beowulf adaptation podcast. Yeah. Sounds great. Yes. So. I'm going to see if there's one, if, if one already exists, because if not, it could be a real moneymaker. <laughs> at the very least, you know, maybe we can bring it to Corey and Maggie of Other Minds and Hands. That would be, ooh. that would be, ooh, 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 ooh. We're stirring mm. the pot here, people. <laughs> okay. Lightning, right, round lightning round question. question. Lightning round question. Are you ready? All right. If you could have any fantasy mentor character Character. or teacher like teacher mentor figure in fantasy as your personal teacher who would it be damn yeah (laughs) this one gets people thinking and it's a lightning round question so i'm really mean about it uh so of all fantasy characters who would i choose as my mentor Mm -hmm. teacher someone with a teacher label a character with a teacher label or a mentor the classic mentor cambellian mentor figure um, however you want to categorize the word teacher i think uh that i would have to choose galadriel Ooh, say why yeah right She's really I mean, cool. She's she's been there since the beginning, right? She woke she up and uh, you know, and seen all the evil that we can do. We we mortals or quasi mortals, um, but also all the good, right? And and she has resisted temptation uh, to set everything aright according to her wishes, which is of course the big temptation for all of us humans is to use what power, whether it be great or small. Uh, to set things according to our wishes instead of living in in some kind of community. So yeah, so you know, I think I think she would have a lot to teach me. I think you're right, and the fact that she has changed and she's so dynamic over the course of the three four ages, mm-hmm. and she learns from her mistakes. Yeah. that's a really important quality as a teacher. And of course, most importantly, stories. Stories. She, she has them. She's got them. Yeah. She's got them. She's got them and she tells them. She does. I love that answer. That's a great answer. Thank you. Yay. You're welcome. So do you have any projects or publications upcoming that you'd like to share with us before we say goodbye? Anything you'd like to share? Anything you're rolling around in your brain project-wise that you think people yeah. should be aware of? I don't know if, if this is actually possible anymore because I'm really, really late. Um, but long years ago, Back in the aughts, I started a project that ended up in the Tolkien Encyclopedia about the influence of the Exodus poem on on Tolkien. And I am finally working that up into an actual article. So that's that's kind of, you know, between grading and teaching and all that that I'm poking at slowly uh, to try to get it finished. Uh, And hopefully into a book collection, unless the editor has just given up on me and moved on. (laughs) 
but you know, even if she, even if she has done that, I will try to get that published somewhere. But that's that's kind of what I'm working on right now. Exit. Yeah. Uh, did Tolkien ever write on the Exodus poem, or yeah. did he uh, write he criticism on it? He was preparing a, an edition, translation, and commentary, which Ooh. was published posthumously by uh, uh, Jern, Joan Turville Petra. Oh. Um, in I what seventy eight, was... you can't. You can hardly find it. If your library has a copy, you're lucky. Um, but you can't really find one for sale, or if you do, it's thousands of dollars because there was only it was a very limited run. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a PDF, but don't tell anybody. Him. <laughs> but yeah, so he 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 was preparing so um, and uh, two of of Tolkien's important published essays uh, are related to each other um, uh, on the Sigilhuara. Uh, which uh, uh, were done in 1932 and 1934, uh, and so he's you know asking the question, well, who are these people, uh, and and why do they have that name, and what does that name mean, and um, so on and so forth. Uh, very very important two part study, uh, but the inspiration for that comes from the Exodus poem. And then it went on to influence the geography of Middle Earth, as well as inspiration for the Silmarillion. Uh, not the Silmarillion, but the Silmarils uh, are are inspired by the idea of Sigil, right? Which uh, both means sun uh, and jewel in uh, in Old English, right? So that's that's where you get the idea of the Silmarils has sun is in sunlight or sun is in sun is in the uh, orb in the sky. Aha, uh-huh. not sun as in child. Okay, right. that does make more sense. Yeah linguistically and yeah so um, so he did he did quite a bit of work on exodus and he taught it uh more often actually than he taught beowulf i've gone through hammond and skulls you know chronology and pulled out all the semesters in which he taught exodus and beowulf and and you know at least up to uh uh, world war ii right then they were both pretty frequent but still right i mean it's, it's so it's obviously something that that he spent quite a lot of time thinking about and nobody, wow. nobody's written on on its influence. Uh, so. And now you are. Now I am. That's Unless wonderful. somebody beats me to the punch now. <laughs> that the idea is out in the universe. <laughs> it is out there. It is out there. But that's wonderful. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing that when it comes out. Thanks. Dear Larry of Swain, thank you so much for agreeing to chat thank with me today. Me, and I'm really excited to read the Teaching Methods on Beowulf book that's coming out. Very exciting. Good, thank you. And, you know, give the small dragon a big zerbert on the forehead for me. Oh, I shall. I shall. We love that small dragon. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Elise. Listeners, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to hit the subscribe button on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or your other favorite podcast feeds. If you enjoyed listening, please leave a rating and a review as well. You can read and find out more about Teaching with Magic by visiting our website, teachingwithmagic.blog. You can leave a message on our podcast page, read past Teaching with Magic posts, and check out our book lists on our affiliate page. We also invite you to support us on Patreon. You'll have access to bonus material, our Discord channel, live Q&As, and you'll get a sneak peek at future products such as lesson plans, worksheets, and other teaching tools. The link is always available in our show notes and the podcast page on our website. Thanks again for joining us, and as always, keep making magic.